what it is that you've done. Sorry. <laughs> you have um, got it. You have created, you've planted this seed with the idea that you had that we needed to get some information out there on the science of reading and you planted a seed and look at how it has grown and blossomed. Oh my gosh, I am, I am so excited about this. And I want to just thinking about that science of um, reading, we know that acronym really well. I'm going to throw out another one that Pam Snow has helped us understand. This is the one that she came up with. S-O-L-A-R, solar, which would add language to it because we know that the language foundations are also really important. And as we think about the science of reading or think about the science of language and reading and where we are today with phonological awareness and our understanding of phonological awareness, I want you to think about what your journey is and what has where, where you have come from in your understanding of the science of reading and where you want to end up going. And we're all in, as I read your Facebook posts and the queries that you have and the supports that you are providing, it's a, it, it's a really supportive, safe opportunity to continue our journey and deepen our understanding of, of what, uh, what the science of reading is. And we're going to focus on that phonologic piece. And I also want to just express my deep, deep gratitude to all of you and what it is that you do. We're embarking on a new school year after an unprecedented year last year and wondering what our students are going to be able to do and the kinds of things that we hope and expect them to do at their different ages and grade levels and, and where they might be. And I do know that when we help build really valuable phonological awareness, phonological processing skills in the friends who are in our care, we are going to make an incredible difference in their lives. So thank you for your dedication and your commitment to making sure that we are doing the most important and most valuable uh, instruction and using things that we know work. So here's a little bit of my journey in this phonological awareness piece. As a speech and language pathologist, I, uh, I started out in Montana and I spent 20 years working in schools with young kids, little kids. And as a speech therapist, I had lots of little kids who had difficulty learning to say the sounds of our language, the phonemes of our language. And I knew what we could do, what we needed to do in order to help them learn to say the sounds better so that you could understand them. And then generally a couple of years down the road, they were back in the referral process because they were having difficulty learning how to read. And way back at the beginning of my career, and it was decades and decades and decades and decades, and I actually can put that last one up decades ago, we had this understanding that reading was a visual based process. And if you had difficulty, you had problems with your eyes. But I had all these kids who had trouble hearing the sounds to say them and then trying to figure out those sounds were in, in, uh, in learning to read. So it took me down this journey of learning a lot about phonological awareness. And I spent, as I said, 20 years in Montana um, in schools. And then the next 20 years I spent at the University of Montana and I got to teach in the area of early literacy and language development as well as early literacy and language disorders. And phonological awareness was a chunk of what my research agenda included. And so the rest of my journey, after I spent time in Montana, I got to move to Oregon. And now this is the view that I have. So I'm continuing my journey and I get to spend a lot of time Zooming these days and maybe at some point back to a face-to-face -face in a lot of professional development. Because as you can see, I uh, to be the co-author with Louisa Motes, like how in the world did I ever have the opportunity to write a book with Louisa Motes? Oh, my gosh, I'd still pinch myself. So I get to do a lot of, uh, a lot of professional development in, in, in that kind of realm with a lot of teachers of Crog Cross. And so just to give you a sense of some of the other elements that I've written and talked about 
in putting a lot of pieces together. And in that journey, I have discovered that phonological awareness is a really important piece, but it's a bigger notion than just phonological awareness. And so what I'd like to do in our time together is share some of the learnings that I have had. I'm gonna have, make sure that everybody is on mute. Yes. There we go. There, I think we did got that taken care of. So let's check on our journey and follow your journey. Check where you are on your journey and see what kinds of things you understand and, and know or uh, in what it is that we are um, going to share tonight and see where you're at with your journey. Okay, Put the arrow in the right spot. So there's a handout and Donna's been posting those. It's in a PDF format. And so if you're not able to open it, I'm sorry. Not sure why that would happen. Uh, and, um, but she can post it on the Facebook page if you're not able to get it. And then I also have a participation guide. It's a Word document. And when you see this little key here, key concepts, it is meaning that there's something on that participation guide that you can respond to or answer or think about or contemplate. And so the first element in that, and if you're able to open it, great. If not, you can write it on another piece of paper. Think about what your favorite rhyme activity is. What do you like to do about rhyming? At whatever age or grade level that you get to work with, there's rhyme across, across our lifespan. And also what kind of, uh, what is your favorite blending and segmenting activity? So write those down and we will come back to them. Okay, so here's a little query. This is also on your key concept catcher, that participation guide for you. And just to get a sense of where you are at in, on, in your understanding of phonological awareness. So true or false, think about this. Phonological awareness requires alphabet letters. Is that a true statement or a false statement? And I hope you said false because phonological awareness is a skill in and of itself, in and of, its, of itself. You can close your eyes and do phonological awareness in the dark. And we have this group of letters that we know, but here's a, here's a, here's a, a take home point. What we do know, particularly when, little, when kids are little, when they're in the developmental phases of learning about how to play with words, when you include sound play, word play, and letters together. It makes for better learning opportunities. And that grade age range is preschool, certainly into kindergarten as children are learning about the alphabet and building their phonemic awareness. Okay, so let's look at number two. Which, which do young children learn to play with first? Play with or manipulate first. Do they learn to play with syllables first? or sounds first. And I get a bit of different uh, responses, but here's what that response is, syllables. Mm -hmm. And that is actually, when we get to that part, that's a very early developing skill. Think about a little friend singing, learning to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. What do they do with the words twinkle and little? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, right? A natural rhythm in how it is that we talk is based in syllables. And that is occurring when children are pretty little, preschoolers, uh, toddlers into preschooler. Okay, here's a tricky one. How many speech sounds are in the word fix? Philomena, you're right on it. So let's try it, get your fingers ready. Everybody get your hands ready. You have to use some kind of gesture. I'll talk about that. Fix, it starts with a eh. Now careful, the next sound is a k. And then the final sound is s. So if you listen to, what's the last sound in fix? Oh, s. Four sounds in fix. Got that? All right, how about this one, catch? How many speech sounds are there in the word catch? Uh, mm -hmm. Three, got that one, great. All right, now this is a very particular specific response to this query. What phonological awareness skill at the beginning of kindergarten is strongly predictive of literacy learning in second grade? 
So if a child can do this particular phonemic awareness, phonological phonemic awareness skill, we have a pretty good uh, assurance that they are on the right track, the right trajectory for learning to read. And it is, Erica saying initial sound isolation. Mm -hmm. Here is, let's see, here is a phone. What does phone start with? Here's a heart. I kind of have a lot of hearts, if you might imagine, with that being my name. What does heart start with? There's a cup. What does cup start with? That particular skill is highly predictive of how well a child's funnel early literacy development is progressing. Okay, so check on your journey. How did you do? If, you're, if you are getting those pretty easily, great. Your journey is progressing. If there were some that were a little bit um, um, pondering, wondering about, then there's more to figure out. Cool. Okay, so here's what our agenda is going to be. The green uh, looking glass, what we're gonna look at is phonological foundations. We're gonna have some fun with some phonological foundations. Then we'll look at, talk about some assessment uh, considerations, connections that we want to make sure that we're uh, including in the interactions that we have with our friends. And then talk about some instruction and intervention strategies. And an important component in, I think in anything that we do is understanding the why of what it is that we do, because that way we're going to know what some parameters are when children are getting it and knowing what to do next, or when our students are not getting something that we want them to do and knowing what to do. So let's take a look at foundations. So in the report of the National Reading Panel, 20 years later, this was an article that Susan Brady wrote in the Reading League Journal. There is convergent evidence, a lot of settled science of the importance of phonemic awareness and also letter skills for learning to read. It's indisputable. And what I like to think about in terms of literacy is we can think about how many of you like really good cookies, <laughs> right? Good cookies. And we can talk about the ingredients, but those ingredients need to go together in a way where the ingredients have to have the right amount, quantity and quality. And we put them together in an order that is going to make a really delicious cookie in our recipe. And in my mind, I think phonological awareness is like the butter because phonological awareness binds the oral language. It's critical for oral language development, the phonologic aspect. And it also is really important for written language and it binds both of those together. Okay, so we talked about reading. I also wanna have a plug in for writing. Writing is a really, really important aspect of literacy learning. To me, it's like breathing. You breathe in, which is what reading is, and you breathe out which is what writing is. And when we have a really good, well thought out and planful writing approach and instructional approach, our students are going to um, become even more competent literacy learners. Okay, so here are some ponders. What is your understanding or your sense of these pH terms? So there's a kind of a, yeah, happy face, I got this, or hmm, it's a ponder. What do you feel, where are you at on your journey and your understanding of the distinction between phonological and phonemic awareness? Give yourself a little rating. How about the distinction between, or what these kind of all go together, not so much of a distinction, a little bit, but phonological naming, retrieval, and recoding. Hmm, yeah. How about phonological working memory? How about phonological sensitivity? How about phonological representation? Lots of pH words, and they are really important. I call those the spices of our recipe. They're really important elements and deepening our understanding of what all those components are and how they contribute to phonological awareness competency is important. So let's take a look at what they are. This is a chart out of letters for early childhood educators that I've put together. And for a very long time, 
we have had a pretty settled science and research that has identified three components of phonological processing. So three components are that first one, you say it, the first one is phonological awareness. And we know in that we have rhyme and we have syllable awareness and we have phoneme awareness, a phoneme as a speech sound, a sound awareness. And then the second one in the middle is we're phonological naming. And you'll see word retrieval there and word recoding. There are little nuances of differences, but they're pretty well connected in that phonological naming piece. And then the third component of phonological processing is phonological working memory. And here are the key elements, short term, short term, and it's temporary storage. So let's try this activity. Say the word tiger, say it out loud. Tiger. Say it again and don't say g. Tire. You did it. All right, so you had to hold which word in your short term working memory? You had to hold the word tiger. Well, yeah, that's the word I want to deal with. And then with your phonological awareness skills, what did you do? You had to extract or delete the g. And then you recoded that word. So tiger was recoded mm -hmm. into tire. tire. Mm -hmm. That is what phonological processing is. And you can see how critical those other elements of memory and naming contribute to the phonological awareness competency. So phonological awareness from a definition perspective is consciously manipulating or playing with the sound elements and syllable elements of, uh, of language. When it's only syllable or when it's only sounds, then it's phonemic awareness. So if you're singing twinkle, twinkle, little star and playing with the syllables and twinkle, twinkle, phonological. Mm -hmm. But if you were thinking about what does twinkle start with? Oh, t -t -t, speech sound. That's a phoneme. So that's phonemic awareness. And phonological naming is being able to come up with it. words that are pre that, that you know, but pretty quickly. Let me ask you this. Let me see if any of you have had any phonological naming challenges in a class of students where you might have called one student by another friend's name. <laughs> you ever done that? <laughs> right. So the word that you wanted to retrieve, yeah, didn't come up for you as quickly as you wanted to, but a neighbor word in that same lexical <laughs> connection came up. All right, so that's phonological naming, coming up with, with the words that you know really quickly. And then phonological working memory, storing something short term to do something with it, and then it will disappear. Like, for example, how many of you experienced this where you meet some, somebody new? Hi, my name is Lucy. And you talk about the weather. Holy cow, we are in a heat wave again. And then in about 10 seconds, where's that person's name? It left you. Now, what would happen, though, if that person's name was the same name as your mother? Now, would it disappear? Or would it stick? It would stick. Mm -hmm. And that is this term, phonological representation. Let's chat about that a little bit. Oh, I have an example, another example of phonological processing. So here is a little friend. We were playing in a grab bag surprise. So one of my activities to have little things in a little bag, grab bag surprise, and I pulled one out. Got this kindergartner age child. He's struggling with the literacy learning process. And I say, guess what this is? And I say, it's a eh. Shh. And he says, ish. Let's try it again. Now I use my fingers. Ish. And again, he says, ish. All right. So I was up here with this skill. I had to step it down. So what should I do to step it down? Reduce the number of parts. So I went to this. 
Let's try it one more time. What's this? Ish. And he uh, says, fish. Fish. Mm -hmm. fish. Now think about those components. Was he able to, in his phonological awareness skills, was he able to take parts of a word and put them together? No, he could blend. He could blend parts. Could he come up with and recode that word? He said yeah. ish. So he could, he, he could take, what was the issue? Let's get to this third part. How was his phonological working memory? How many parts could he hold? He could hold two parts. Mm -hmm. He knew that there was this way. Lucy, you're muted, Lucy. You're muted. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so he could blend pieces together. He could retrieve or recode a word, but he could only keep two things in his memory. That was a that was certainly learn, that was a learning um, experience for me. Okay, so short-term work in memory. So let's talk about phonological representation. And what phonological representation is, is your inner speech. Think about the name of your significant partner or a close family member's name. Hopefully that comes to you pretty quickly. <laughs> right? You have that name stored inside your head really, really well. It's called inner speech. And it's really important for understanding language. It's under for vocabulary, for speech production. This was a little friend that came to see me and said, I want to make the alligator go up. <laughs> what word was this little friend trying to say? Yes. Elevator, but was elevator stored inside his head? Did he have a phonological representation for elevator? No. Nope. What was close? Alligator. And I bet you all have funny stories of things that you have told that you have said, or things that you have heard your friends say, your students say, when they come up with something that's just a little bit goofy like that. Your little girl, Marla, your little girl calls an elevator an alligator too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so phonological representation is how we have words, the pronunciation of word, words stored in our head, in our speech. This was my daughter when she was in kindergarten. She said, you know what, mom? Rhinoceroses and our ancestors and end brothers to dinosaurs with one horn. She has a sister and she knows that, well, if you got an ancestor, you must be able to have an end brother. So what do I know <laughs> about her ability to be flexible and thinking about words? <laughs> yes. She also is an artist today. She lives in Portland. I never always really knew what color her hair was going to be. <laughs> Okay, phonological representations of the whole words to word parts, those segmental units of parts of words is necessary for explicit development of phonemic awareness. So you have to hold the word in your phonological memory, know how to pull it apart, and that is what phonemic awareness is. Okay, so that was one big term that you might not be so familiar with. Here is the other one that I find that is um, that I think contributes a lot to the conversation. And it is phonological sensitivity. And it is a time period when infants and toddlers are becoming sensitive to the sounds, the speech sounds, the syllable patterns, the word boundaries of the language that they are loved in. And we know when thinking about, thinking about oral language development, babies start to babble and they babble the sounds that they have heard and they babble the syllable structures that they have heard and they're playing with those sounds. They've become sensitive to it. So we have this little friend, how old would you say he is? Two maybe, a toddler. And he says, donatar, donatar. Well, she really means go in the car and his phonological sensitivity is still developing. His phonological processing system is still developing. 
as he is learning to say more of the phonemes of our language. And an important connection to this, um, so rhyme sensitivity emerges with speech sound development. That's my granddaughter and she was the main reason I had to move to Oregon because that's where she lives. So when she was a toddler, she has a hat because it can get kind of cold here in Oregon. And so she has a hat and so she's learning to say hat, but her hat is very adorable. It's in the shape of a cat. And so for her to know what the difference is between hat and cat, she has to become phonologically sensitive to the differences between those two words. And that is an important element and aspect in toddlers vocabulary development, that phonological sensitivity, sensitive to the sounds, syllables, syllable patterns and word boundaries. And so it is also important for second language learners or our EL friends. How many of you are familiar with the stages of second language acquisition and that first stage of the silent stage? It is when children or students, language learners are tuning into the phonological system of that new language that they are learning. They need to go through that phonological sensitivity time period to figure out the speech sounds, the syllable patterns, and the word boundaries. How many of you have tried to learn a language as an adult, another language? Easy or hard? Kim, good facial expression there. <laughs> hard. And when you listen to a native speaker of that language, what does their rate sound like? Foom, right? It is because you have not had the opportunity to go through this phonological sensitivity time period. And you haven't figured out where the word boundaries are because you are not sensitive yet to what those syllable patterns are in that new language. Okay, so there's that. We know that phonological sensitivity develops very early, even before babies are born. You have that slide in the handout until up to three months right now is what the research is helping us identify. And part of that are studies that have been in, in utero and studies that have been done with premature babies who are or babies who are born prematurely. Okay, so we have these two concepts that may be relatively new in your journey of phonological fun. So phonological sensitivity or phonological representation. And these elements, these queries are on your um, participation guide. So when a little friend says, this was a first grader who said this to me, it's hard for me to rememorize. <laughs> what did they put together? Remember and memorize. Yep, and Marla, you're right on the type in there. That's representation. She didn't have those words stored well in her inner speech, and she chunked them together. How about this one? Oh, we already talked about this one. This little friend saying, doing a tar, doing a tar. <laughs> he still is in that, what time period? Sensitivity, mm -hmm. sensitivity time period. This was my granddaughter. She called me up the other day, something broke, and grandpa is a good fixer of things. She called me up and said, grandma, is grandpa available? <laughs> Representation. She knows that word. She can say all the speech sounds, but she got some of those syllables mixed up a little bit. Phonological representation for the word available. Okay, and how about this one? A little friend saying, I wiped the wet one. I willy, willy, willy wipe it. And you said phonological sensitivity, okay? So I hope this has helped move you forward on your journey in understanding and describing a, a, bigger, under, a bigger connection to these phonological foundations more so than just phonological awareness because these two elements will contribute to phonological awareness. Okay, oh, one more. How about this? So a little friend said, I want to turn the, tele the TV channel on asking for the marote. What is that one going to be? 
And again, switching the syllables, all the sounds are there. It's a representation. Okay, let's keep going. Phonological awareness components. There are two components, blending and segmenting, and you'll notice alliteration is on that block and rhyming. Two different constructs of but both phonological awareness skills. And when we take a look at blending and segmenting, and this is another key concept, synthesis, putting things together. Synthesis is blending. And it is needed for phonetic decoding, for phonics. It's a really important element for phonics. Analysis is taking a word, analyzing what the parts are, and then being able to pull those parts apart. So it could be isolating, it could be classifying, sorting all the words that begin with the same sound or end with the same sound. And phoneme analysis is needed for orthographic learning. So orthographic meaning spelling, how words are written and rapid sight word recognition. So it's important for spelling. It's also important for what we want kids to get to as they are able to recognize words in a really rapid, fluent manner. Okay, and then here's a progression. David Kilpatrick talks about this. This is a little bit adapted from some of his work and adding a little bit more uh, detail into those earliest stages. So in the early phonological awareness component with toddlers, and preschooler uh, uh, into early preschool. And the big key about early is that it's about syllable play, playing with syllables. It's also about rhyme detection, hearing how words sound the same. And then basic phonological awareness, preschool, probably pre-K into grade one. And it's what is accommodated much by our common core standards. And at this point, it is getting down to the most important nugget needed for learning to read and learning to spell. And that is figuring out what individual phonemes are. Segmenting and blending initial sound first and then individual sounds in words. And in kindergarten, it is, is uh, CVC words, pretty simple words. And then by the end of first grade, more complex words. And at this point, rhyme detection changes from just a receptive understanding into an expressive understanding so that you are able to say a word or provide a word that rhymes um, and then even a string of words that rhyme. And then advanced phonological awareness, first grade and beyond. And this is where more of those manipulation tasks, if you're adding a sound, deleting sounds than the one that we did like in Tiger, substituting, reversing sound segments. So, Think about what your phonological, your favorite phonological awareness activities were with rhyming and with blending and segmenting. And then C, is your activity one that is at the early phase? Is it in, oops, is it in that basic phonological awareness level or is it advanced? Okay, I'm seeing lots of things going on in the chat box. So Donna, I'm just gonna have you monitor some of those so we can keep moving forward. So here are some other elements about phonological awareness. As you are working with this skill set in the students that are in your care, there's a linguistic uh, dimension and a cognitive dimension. Linguistic meaning language, and it is um, as children get older, and these are starting with young children, they're able to manipulate progressively smaller and smaller units of a word so that certainly speaks to that syllables develop first, the ability to play with syllables. Another linguistic connection is that familiar words, more familiar words are easier to manipulate than ones that you are not familiar with. Those take more working memory. And then thinking about cognitive skills, which is working memory, and a child, a young child's understanding of what matching means, same and different, and an understanding of oddity. And what the research is showing and identifying is that the cognitive abilities seem to parallel linguistic development, but the exact progression is still needs to be more specified. I know in, the, in a number of the research studies that I did, it seemed that there was a big shift in young children's, preschool age children's ability to play with sounds and words, and that tended to happen at about four and a half. That four and a half to five age range had a much uh, steeper 
trajectory of um, competency in some of the, the tasks that I was able to do. So here is a cognitive example of phonological awareness. And we had one with the fish, with holding two items, but not three. So how many items can a preschool age child typically keep in mind? And it is about two. And that coincides with some of the, you know, we'll be able to follow two-step directions. All right, so let's think about this. Here's a linguistic example. So here is, um, segment the syllables in this word. Easy, kangaroo. Okay, that was fast, kangaroo. Now, segment the syllables in this word. Mm, still working on it. Let me help you. Synecdoche. Let's say it slowly. Synecdoche. Mm -hmm. That was harder. In order for you to read that word, what did you have to do? Did you have to break it apart into the syllable components? Uh huh. And that's where syllables are really important when students are learning to read multisyllabic words. So having that framework and that understanding of what syllables are is important for their next, uh, for, for those, that next step in their uh, reading progress. Synecdoche. Anybody know what synecdoche means? It's a great word. It's a figure of speech that represents that when a, a word Re, uh, is used, a part of something is used to represent the whole. So here's a vocabulary routine that we talk about in letters for early childhood educators. Synecdoche, you say it? A synecdoche is a figure of speech where you take a part of a word to represent the whole. And so you have a gesture that goes along with it and then it makes it stickier. So as an example, um, give me a hand is a synecdoche because I really don't mean that I want your hand. I want your help or I want your whole person to come over and, and uh, help me get through something. Um, what kind of wheels do you drive? <laughs> it's really not Goodyear or <laughs> some of those other kinds of wheels. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so here are well known in the literature, the linguistic hierarchy of words, where think about the phonological awareness programs that you might be using and teaching students to making sure that they're able to identify words in sentences. And then we move up to syllables in a word and then the initial sound, the beginning sound in a word and then phonemes in a word. So let me share this with you with this hierarchy. OK, it, prov it provides the developmental sequence of how phonological to phonemic awareness progress in children's development. And that very bottom one, being able to identify what word boundaries are, is a phonological sensitivity skill. And then all of the rest of them are phonological, phonological skills. And when we get to that initial sound and the rest of the word or the individual sounds, now it's phonemic awareness. So this is early phonological awareness development into basic phonological awareness development. So putting some of those aspects and elements together. Now, this is a very complicated animation slide that I also borrowed from Letters for Early Childhood Educators and adapted it just a little bit so that we could add that more advanced level. So here's the phonological awareness development progression. And if you have this slide on your PowerPoint handout, you can follow along with. Okay, so a component part of phonological awareness is phonemic awareness. And we have those two big constructs, blending and segmenting and rhyming. And the first thing that happens with rhyme is that babies and toddlers learn to say the words that are in the songs that they've been exposed to, finger plays and songs, like Twinkle the La Dar, Hi, where, where you are, uh, Bubba, we're high. Right? Does that sound like a two year old singing Twinkle Twinkle? Okay, and then as their language and cognition is developing, 
They're able to key into the structure of the word and hear how words sound alike at the end. And then moving to the layer, next layer of being able to produce a word that rhymes. Okay, that's rhyme. Blending and segmenting begins with words by syllables and then initial sound. That's frankly what alliteration is. And first, young students, and this is happening in fours generally, four-year-olds, detect the beginning sound of words. What is that beginning or initial sound? Oh, and then able to key into the final sounds. And then onset is being able to identify initial sound and then final sounds. Now hold on to that word onset because you'll notice in my linguistic hierarchy, I didn't use the word onset. I have a little a slide coming up. Okay, so words by sound. Yeah, baby. Kinders are able to, we want them to be able to identify CVC words like house. Say the sounds in house. <gasps> or fish Ish. and then move to by the end of first grade be able to segment sounds that have that are more complex so this ccvc word is harder it would be a word like stop st ah Okay, and then moving into manipulations, and that's the advanced level. So early to basic to advanced. And David Kilpatrick talks about becoming proficient because not only um, being able to um, interact with or manipulate words by, by adding, deleting, switching, reversing, but also doing it um, in a pretty time efficient manner. Okay. That is how phonological awareness develops. Now, here is, what about the word onset? And Gail Gillen, who is from New Zealand, University of Canterbury, and has um, is probably one of the internationally well-known researchers in the area of phonological awareness. And in her most recent book, uh, Phonological Awareness from Research to Practice, she describes this connection between onset and rhyme, R-I-M-E, and the other rhyme, R-H-Y-M-E. But let's look at these words. So if onset is the initial consonant or consonants that precede a vowel in a syllable, and the rhyme, R-I-M-E, or the vowel, maybe in a written format, it may be two letters that are spelling a particular vowel sound, and then the consonants that follow in that syllable. So if we look at this one, rate, what is the, onset of the word rate. And I bet you said, rah. What is the um, first sound, initial sound? Rah. Same. Good. In the word trait, what is the onset? Tra. What is the initial sound? Ooh. T. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to straight, what is the onset? Str. And what is the initial sound? S. And let's try this one. Eight. What is the onset? Ooh. Wait, there isn't one. There is no initial consonant. But what's the initial sound? A. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's compare that with rhyme, R I M E, R H Y M E, I mean. And here's what Gillen says. Let's think about rhyme as bite, light, gate, weight, bait, feet, meat. You can hear those. You don't have to worry about how they spell, but they sound the same at the end. And these words have a rhyme and a rhyme, R-I-M-E and R-H-Y-M-E, with bite, kite, gate, late, feet, beat. And we can think about the R-H-Y-M-E as a phonologic task. It's an oral language task. And the R-I-M-E as an orthographic task, written language spelling, how words are spelled. And here is the issue with using the term onset, particularly when you're working with young children. And in some of the phonological awareness programs that I have seen, where they will take a word like trait or train and say, what is the onset? in a initial sound kind of context. What's the onset? 
And they will say that the onset for trait is tra, rightly so, but it is really confusing for little kids when you are trying to segment all of the sounds. The goal is complete phoneme segmentation and the onset term confounds that. So think about that, ponder. We gotta keep going. Okay, so think about what your ponders are as we come to these back to these terms. The distinction between phonological and phonemic awareness, phonological, phonological naming, retrieval, recoding, working memory, sensitivity, and phonological representation. I hope you're a little further down your journey. Okay, so any kind of comments or questions, we'll put those toward the end so that we can have, let's pull some of these things together and see how they, how they um, come together by talking about assessment and some instruction and intervention. All right, so here is what we know in the science, very well established is that performance-based tasks are a much better measure of phonological awareness than observation or checklists in the early literacy realm. This is probably more relevant in preschool, maybe even into kindergarten, when observational tools seem to have much more prevalence over performance-based tasks. But you will truly get much better information with a performance-based task. Plus, you get the best information in the shortest period of time. Yeah. OK, so we learned earlier that one strong predictor of um, children literacy learning in second grade are based in these two best predictive indicators. Phoneme awareness, sound isolation. The second best one is letter, what's that second word? Letter name knowledge. Mm -hmm. Letter name knowledge, meaning that letter sound knowledge is important. We're gonna teach it. But letter name knowledge from an assessment perspective gives us much better information about a child's understanding of the literacy process. Okay, so that name knowledge is an important element when we think about assessment. This was a study done by Hugh Katz, another very credible researcher has contributed so much to our understanding of the science of reading. And in an article from a few years ago, just five, six years ago, early identification of reading disabilities within an RTI framework. And here are the items that should be on a universal screening battery at the beginning of kindergarten. So letter names and naming them quickly. That is a phonological naming task. Phoneme awareness, so being able to match words that have the same sounds in them. Rapid naming, and the, the uh, stimulus used for those are common pictures and non-word repetition. So being able to um, repeat a word that is unfamiliar to you. So it might be something like this. Say, galopadoop. And so, children being able to repeat that back, give us an idea of how their phonological processing is. So how about a quick comment about um, rapid naming? This has been something that in relative recent um, science of reading research coming out um, even more powerfully, some of the work that, uh, that um, Roland Good and Ruth Kaminsky are doing related to rapid automatized naming tasks. And that's what RAN stands for, rapid automatized naming. And those tasks are going to be more relevant at different ages and different instructional levels. So think about the students that are in your care. When you have little friends, you wanna have them name objects, colors if they know them or shapes. Those are more predictive of young children's literacy development. Um, and that generally is before reading instruction occurs. But when kids know letters, low letter names, and they know numerals, then it's a better predictor for older students after the onset of reading instruction. And so when you have older students who are still struggling with letter names, numeral naming, coming up with the word that you know that they know, you wanna make sure that you are helping that student 
uh, get a very thorough phonological awareness assessment, but even more so a bigger, broader picture is a phonological processing assessment so that you can identify what that friend's rapid automatized naming tasks or abilities are, also what working memory um, abilities are. Okay, so we have these screening tasks. Are they instructional tasks? Yes or no? So here are those screening tasks that Hugh Katz helped us identify. So let's think about this, letter name fluency. Do we teach letter names? Do we teach students letter names? I hope you're shaking your head. <laughs> yes, if they don't know them. Phonemic awareness, do we teach phonemic awareness? Yes. Do we teach rapid naming? No, we don't. It is a good assessment task. It is not a good instructional task. You can practice it, Monica says. Think about this in a medical realm. You go to the doctor and one of the first things the doctor does is take your pulse and finds out that your pulse is not where it should be. Do you go home and work on your pulse? Or do you go home and do things that are going to impact your pulse? Mm -hmm. And what the research says is that you can't teach rapid automatized naming. You can't teach working memory, but you can teach phonological awareness and phonemic awareness and the benefit that higher competency levels in phonemic awareness help to fill in rapid, automat uh, rapid uh, word retrieval or word naming kinds of difficulties when there's a difficulty to, um, uh, that, that we've experienced. Okay, and then how about this last one? Non-word repetition, do we teach that? I'm gonna say maybe, and here is the caveat to this, and it's another important connection of phonological processing phonological representation is that when you are a little kid and you hear a word, a word that you don't know, it is an unfamiliar word. It's a non-word to you. And so you learn a new word, you learn what the word means, but you also need to learn how to pronounce it. That's an important phonological connection. Okay, so here are some assessment uh, tools that are available, the Pelly is a great one for preschool. <clears throat> There's another one, my IGDES, uh, Individual Growth and Development Indicators is another assessment screening tool. Um, PALS from the uh, University of Virginia, really great reading, has a phonological awareness survey and it's free. And uh, Kilpatrick's PAST test, uh, phonological awareness screening test, uh, and that one also is free. And actually, the same name of a test by Zong passed. Um, Kilpatrick passed. Um, from a clinical perspective, I would use that task with late first graders into uh, second, third, and above. For younger children, because the past Kilpatrick's past test, it's a great one. It uses deletion. And deletion is really hard for young children as they are building that working memory and building their competency and being able to create or provide some of those um, or do some of those tasks. And so here's the importance of our assessment. We know that the, what the precursors of dyslexia are in early literacy. We can't diagnose dyslexia when children are little, but we can identify risk for potential dyslexia later on down the road. And we can see those precursors or when we see challenges with phonological awareness, when children have difficulty with rapid automatized naming tasks, when there is a working memory issue, when they're having difficult, difficulty learning about the letters, and when there is a vocabulary oral language kind of difficulty. And it's been shown to have, these indicators have been shown to have pretty robust precursors of identifying risk in children as young as three and into kindergarten. Yeah, and the importance of assessment. We can identify that risk with 70, 50 to 70% accuracy when we measure these tasks, when we assess these tasks. If kids are doing it well, great. If they're struggling with it, 
There's no time like right now to help build that phonological piece. Risk can be identified in first grade with an even higher accuracy level. And you see scores on non-word fluency. That means their phonological processing system is not working well. Oral reading fluency, that can often be related to rapid automatized naming, coming up with the word that you're trying to think of or read about, um, how well students respond to intervention, and when there is a listening comprehension and reading comprehension difference or discrepancy. So it's that element of what it is that we do when kids are little that will build a really important foundation. So those are some assessment considerations. Let's talk about some instruction considerations and see how these fit within uh, the um, interventions, instruction that you do with your students, with your friends. What we know when we start early is that early intervention is four times more effective than later intervention. And the return on investment with, with a range of research that has been done for every dollar spent can give you a buyback of 16 to $31. I like those kinds of returns. And every time you wait a year and you have kind of an itch that this pre-K kid is ooh, not really able to say the colors, can match colors really well and not coming up with the words that you know that little friend knows. Or in kindergarten where the letter name, learning is really a struggle not coming up with it, even though it seems to be an, even though it doesn't seem like it should be that hard for that little friend. Every year that we write, it diminishes the effectiveness of our instruction of our intervention by 25 to 50%. It's more expensive and it is, requires more intensity. And that doesn't even speak to the emotional trauma, the emotional challenge that students have when they go to school every day and they know they're not getting it. And we can identify that risk early on with a pretty high level of, of uh, accuracy. So what, what uh, Fumiko Heft says is structured literacy and structured literacy instruction works for all. It works for everybody. And it's absolutely necessary for many of our friends. Okay, so let's think about what kinds of expectations we should have. And this is gonna be on your participation guide. When, what are the approximate age expectations of these skills? When do children blend and segment syllables? What age range should we expect that to be occurring? Three to fours, mm -hmm. three to four year olds. How about being able to match words that rhyme? That's a big preschool connection, three to five. Initial sound segmentation. Do we expect three-year-olds to be able to do that? Shake your head like this. No. With good instruction, can they learn? Mm -hmm. But we expect that at that pre-K year into kinder, early kinder. Rhyme production is that same kind of time frame, pre-K into kinder. Being able to segment single syllable words, that's kindergarten being able to participate and uh, do sound manipulations. And that's later on, first into second grade. So it's a good progression of what we can expect. We can, what we do know is that teaching phonological awareness skills, explicit instruction, having some kind of designed phonological awareness curricula or program is what the current recommendation is. But the other thing that we can do is embed phonological awareness into our everyday routines. When we are giving instructions, oh, guess what? We're going to line up because it's time to go to the bribery. And kids, wait, what? No, it's not the bribery. What is it? It's the library. And I will say that, and this is, this was my, it's my personal observation and opinion to date is that most early learning curriculums, early reading curriculums that you might have, early literacy curriculums in preschool will need enhanced phonological awareness planning and instruction. Okay, so here are some of those ways of embedding phonological awareness into the earliest grades. So when kids are lining up or taking attendance, 
you can rhyme their names. Who's here? Lori Bori is here. Deborah Gabra is here. Valerie Ballery is here. Jill Pill is here. Jill, have you ever been called Jill Pill? <laughs> Maybe. Okay, change the beginning sound in a, in a student's name. Use rhyming words and give in directions. Point out words in songs and in books. Wow, did you hear that? That rhymes. And so, so many more. Lots of ideas of things that you can add. Um, a little bit older, kindergarten into first grade. Again, change their names. Play with that beginning sound in words. Use an alphabet chart and give children a rhyming word so that you can point to the alphabet letters. So you have um, rope. Let's go through the alphabet consonant letters. If you have rope, let's rhyme it. B says bope, C says cope, D says dope, F says fope, G says gope, through the end. Lots of, um, of uh, manipulation of what those letters are. And rhyme actually is a manipulation task. Um, create a chart using phonetic patterns that you teach. Whoops, so, so many more. Okay. Blending and segmenting hints. Let's see where we're at here. Motions, use motions or gestures. Here's a new word that I learned, kinnings. Where do you think the K-I-N comes from? Kinesthetic. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do, this is my personal preference. I like to do syllables starting with my, use my left hand on my right arm so that it is in front of children going in a left to right direction. But start at my wrist and move up. That way you can get to many more longer syllable <laughs> words. Some programs start here and go down and you've got three. You can go under your arm, but that is a harder concept. So that's my personal preference. And I use my arm because it's a bigger motor movement. With, with sounds and words, segment the sounds in this word. How about, um, how about itch? Itch. Well, that was only two. That wasn't very fun. How about heart? Art. Heart. And so fingers, which is smaller motor wise. You want to highlight the mouth gesture. And so with little kids, have a mirror that they can look at to see what your mouth does when you make the b sound or the s sound. Having a mirror gives you that kinesthetic feedback of what's going on. And you want to make sure when you are uh, segmenting, have about one syllable or one second intervals. And to make it a little more challenging for children, stretch it out because that's going to tax their phonological memory. To make it easier when kids aren't being as successful as we want, then we can shorten that, that uh, time period, that one second interval. We want to make sure that we're saying the sounds of the word. So in this word, it's not D-O-G. It's not D-A-G. That gives you a D-A-G. But we want to clip it as short as we can. D-A-G. Syllables are easier than um, words. Beginning sounds are easier in a word. And then the next step is final sounds in a word and the middle sound is the hardest. And when you have consonant blends, those are more difficult. And the whole goal of phonological awareness is to isolate all the sounds in a word and then be able to manipulate them. So other examples for pre-K and K, hickety pickety bumblebee, please say your name for me. And you can say your name with syllables Alyssa, Christy. You can say it with beginning sounds, all kinds of things. You can have children blend and segment new vocabulary words, really valuable in helping build the phonological representation for the new words they are learning. Use robot reporting when you give a direction. Say um, which word weighs more using a balance scale that you have with counters and use pictures of words like helicopter, helicopter, or piano, piano, four and three go on different sides. Um, I spy games, all kinds of sorting games to go along with, with uh, the activities. 
How about picture puzzles? Where you take a picture, cut it into its parts. Here's one, how about this? Guess what this word is? It's a vol k no. And you put it together. Whoa, let's see. Vol k no. Pull it apart, put it together. So syllables, we can have initial sound. Guess what this one is? Snake. Snake. Pull it apart. Segment, blend, together. And then individual sounds. How about this one? I have a p, a, t, p, a, t, together. Ooh, what would happen if I changed the middle sound to a? Then what would it be? So we have p, a. And what is this one gonna be now? So phonological awareness task, and now we've added an oral language component to it. And then the Elkonin boxes where you finger tap. Okay, someone has their anime button on. <laughs> so you can do that with progressively more difficult words, taking picture puzzles and uh, thinking about the vocabulary that young children are using, so many elements of things that we can do to build phonological awareness, embed phonological awareness activities across the day. And what we know that if students have not established well, um, well developed basic phonemic awareness skills, they should absolutely receive a comprehensive phonological processing assessment to determine areas of need, determine what their phonological awareness are, um, abilities are, rapid automatized naming, their word retrieval, and their work in memory. And if phonological awareness skills are underdeveloped, um, for older students, the activity should not include letters. Letters should be included when kids are little and in that developmental time period. But if students are struggling with phonological awareness beyond that time period where phonics is fairly well expected, and there is an underlying weakness in that student's phonological processing abilities, the letters may, can be used as a crutch and you wanna build that phonological system. And then when they're able to identify the sounds, then apply the letters that may represent the spellings in those words. Okay, so some advanced phonological awareness skills, some deletion at a syllable level, remember, member, ice to mice, addition, where you add a sound, substitution, where you can change take to bake, and then change bake to bail, um, reversals, saying pat to tap. And at that higher level, that more advanced level of phonological awareness, it's rapid and um, accurate. And so here are some tier one programs for teaching phonological awareness, ladders to literacy, Hagerty, uh, phonemic awareness, um, Marilyn Adams book, Road to the Code. And here it's just a real quick, what to do when a child is not able to accomplish a rhyme task. And these are some scaffolds, good scaffold um, strategies that we have. These are in your PowerPoint. And what to do when a child is is uh, learning, we wanna make it more challenging. And we go to those next levels. Same thing with blending and segmenting. So when a child or a student is having difficulty, these are some things that we can do to help. Imitate first, physical assist, providing some kind of choice, using mouth cues so that that provides another hint, using listening devices. And a listening device that I love is a whisper phone made out of PVC. So two elbows and about a three inch piece. I like an uh, inch and a half the best. A little bit fatter gives you a little bit better sound quality. And the rail, reason I like these different than the ones that you can purchase is that you can do a twist. And now I can do a drive-by where bulldozer. You just heard that and now I can twist it and it's your turn, you say it. So you've heard my voice say it, and now you have the opportunity to say it, bulldozer. 
And then to make it more challenging, you go to that next level on the linguistic hierarchy or the next more challenging PA skill. Okay, so here's some tier one programs, tier two, tier three programs that are listed for you. Here's some websites. I love the Florida Center for Reading Research for activities. Those are vetted and vetted is important. The um, PALS, uh, Virginia, PALS at Virginia, uh, University of Virginia has some nice activities. Reading Rockets has some activities. And what you wanna make sure that you do is make sure your activities come from, if you're making them up, that, you, that they're following what we know that is, and they are guided by science. Okay, so here's what we did. I talked too much. So we talked about foundations had some fun with some foundations, talked about the importance of assessment and some instruction and intervention strategies. And what I hope you have are some big ahas and an action plan for what you wanna do in continuing and building the phonological uh, processing systems for the students who are in your care. <sighs> okay, so let's have a little bit of conversation questions, comments, discussion, and I can stay as long. I know it's getting quite late for some of you. The sun's still out where I am. <laughs> I don't know about you, Dr. Lucy, but I'm exhausted. So you must be just exhausted. You spoke a whole like 75 minutes. It's crazy. Well done. Thank you. I do have some questions that I put um, onto notes. So uh -huh. I don't know if I can... Can you, um, let me let me see if I can share my screen. Um, you okay, need let me unshare. Yep. Perfect. Okay, I'm looking at some of these questions. Third graders, third graders, you wanna take words and have them manipulate it. Say the word bake. Okay, change the beginning sound to a uh, t. And now you have take. Okay, now change the middle sound to an app. Ah. So you do some of those chainings, um, word chains with older students. And then fun ones are um, reversals. Say the word tap. Say tap. Say it again and switch the first sound to the last and the last sound to the first. And then you come up with pat. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Here's here we go. Let's do this. Are you sharing your screen? Yep. Can you see it? Yeah. It it uh, disappeared behind something. There we are. Okay. Got it. Okay. So I just was capping them. Okay. So if you're teaching children in second language, would they go through those three areas over again, hopefully just at a faster rate? Yes. Yeah, what the silent stage, the, according to the research on this um, uh, sequential language acquisition, the silent stage lasts, can last from about six months to two years. So exposure is going to contribute to that a lot. What is the quote about the language that you are loved in? Uh, that's what Louisa Motes describes that. She talks about, you know, we, we want to make sure from a cultural, from a linguistic, from uh, responsiveness and sensitivity, we want to make sure that, that we are celebrating and understanding the elements and differences of language between the school dialect and the language that children are loved in. I think it's such, such just, it's such a beautiful way of framing that. Okay, elaborate on performance-based tasks. That is sitting down and having a, um, a series of words that you might want to have children identify the initial sound. Or tell me five words, or tell me a word where, uh, what word rhymes with. Where it is a task where you have the children do the same thing, each child gets to do the same thing and you're using the same ruler each time when you do a uh, like a screening in the fall, 
uh, progress monitor check in January and then at the end. Different than I'm sitting in a group of preschool children and we are um, singing a song and I say, oh, who can tell me a word that rhymes with? And then I observationally note that, oh, a couple kids were able to do that. That would be an example of an observational tool, different than let's sit down, I have these five words I want you to uh, tell me the initial sound on or tell me a word that rhymes with. So, hope that makes sense. Okay. Oh, this is a, the next one. It's a really great reading, PA. Yes, yes thank you. Yep, yep. And um, what does early intervention mean for students who enter grade three or later for the first time? Yeah, and you probably have a lot of EL kids. Well, and they are learning English as another language. And so having a good understanding of the developmental sequences across a number of realms of, of um, language development, particularly important for EL kids is knowing what that developmental, the stages of second language acquisition are. And important in the instructional routine is to make sure that you're using a multi-sensory approach where um, a, a bit slower rate of speech, using gestures, using visual cues to point out whatever word you might be referring to, if that's a possibility, if, if there is a visual cue. The other piece is saying a sentence that, that a functional sentence that then children have an opportunity to repeat because learning language is auditory, but it is also expressive. You have to practice saying some, the sentence structures or the sentence forms in order to learn that language. Um, the good, you know, depending on two things I'm thinking about. The good thing is, is as a third grader, there's been hopefully a lot of good language learning from the the first seven years, seven or eight years, if a, if a student has a good language base in their language that they're loved in, their native language, learning the second language is gonna be easier. It will be a harder road to hoe when the first language has not developed very adequately or uh, competently either. Okay, been hearing more and more that we should use printed letters as we teach phonological awareness skills, I've always been told, as Lucy said, that we do it without letters and in the dark. Okay, so this is more from a clinical, or so, so a couple of thoughts. With young children, yeah, use letters. So on my, on my uh, car, my picture puzzles, got the letters right there. And so you have this picture puzzle for a little kid and his name is Victor. Oops, where did the V go? His name is Victor. He's looking at that saying, ha, huh, cool, that's in my name. And so it's a letter exposure. That is really cool. And it gives children a sense, oh, that's what vol looks like. Or that's what s looks like. So let me tell you a quick story. I did an assessment with a first grader. I'd been following her for a couple of years and she had some language challenges. They were developing pretty well. When she was in first grade, she knew all of her letter names and letter sounds. So she had good instruction in letter names and letter sounds, but she was not figuring out how to decode words. She was not using that information to decode. So I did a phonological awareness assessment with her and determined from this diagnostic assessment that her phonological awareness skills were pretty weak. So in the clinic with her mom there, I had all of my preschool based picture puzzles that had the letters on them and she could do them, rip them off, rip them off, ish, ouse. So her mom thought, well, this is pretty cool. Where did, you know, where do you get those puzzles? They went home and got magazines and cut out picture puzzles from the magazines. She couldn't do it. She couldn't identify what the parts were mm. because her phonemic awareness skills were not developed. Now she could do it pretty readily when the letter was there because she was using that letter knowledge to then help tell what the sound was. And so for her, we had to not use letters to build the foundation of phonemic awareness, then attach the letter to it. And so it depends on whether it is instruction, tier one instruction, 
or whether you're moving into this is a challenge for this little friend and knowing what that and knowing the why of what it is that you are doing. Okay, what assessment did I do for that little friend? Uh, it was the phonological awareness test from Lingua Systems. Okay, um, so let me get through a couple more of these hearing. So, so back to that question of should you use letters or not? There's a really important element of thinking of what the sound is, the sound to print, speech to print. And so that connection, I think, is a really important one to know about. But you want to make sure that students are able to do the sound piece to then get to the letters. OK. All right. Ongoing discussion Twitter right now about using letters or, or not with phonological learning skills. That's going to sort itself out because it's a bigger notion than just yes or no. There is a particular purpose of when and why you do it. Hmm. Yeah. And it has to do with the tier that you're working with the the multiple systems of supports um, and how that student is progressing, where they're at along the developmental uh, trajectory. Okay. Okay, so we have some more here in the chat. Okay. Like quite a bit <laughs> since I looked last. Um, Here's one from Kristen. Do I teach preschool or children's letter names first or letter sounds first or both at the same time? Six components. Name, shape, upper and lowercase shape, sound, a target word with the sound that you are teaching, um, and writing it. So I get all of those. That's a component that we talk about in letters for early childhood educators. You want to talk about all of the attributes that are a part of a letter. And then the letter of the week is not going to accommodate a schedule like that. You want to do several letters in a week so that you can cycle and cycle through them across uh, uh, multiple cycles through the school year. Because we know that distributed and repeated practice is a really important teaching element that we embed into our instruction. OK. OK, Dr. Lucy, did you get the third qu question? Um, is it the, someone said you missed the third. Oh, question. Kilpatrick, thank you. Kilpatrick recommends onset rhyme as a scaffold for kids who struggle with syllables. Yeah, so he and I have had a conversation about this and the onset rhyme, what it is, is initial sound. Oh, and so this gets into like a graduate level of phonetics <laughs> when, we, when we think about onset and rhyme. If they're struggling with syllables, then we want to do syllables. And syllables, as we talked about, is surely a phonological awareness task, but there's a whole lot of phonological sensitivity to it as well. And as a speech and language pathologist, when I see a student who struggles with hearing the syllables in a word, then I really want to figure out what's going on from a phonological processing perspective in that little friend. So with the term onset, and when you include words that have a multi, when have more than one consonant sound, those are harder for little kids. So let's try this. Let me see if this will help as an example. When you say the word black and you want to stretch it out, say the word black like you have a Southern accent. Black, what did you do? You segmented the first sound from the second sound. When you say train, when you stretch it out, train. And there are, this is another, we could have, we could do a little phonology piece, Donna, and talk about the speech sounds of language and what the rule structures are in English. And that, those are some underlying um, understandings that contribute to 
phonological awareness and why the onset piece when there's more than one consonant becomes really tricky in phonological awareness. Mm -hmm. My best advice in dealing with the term onset, you can use onset, but make sure you are selecting words that have an initial one consonant. Or if you have a word that has two consonants, just focus on one phoneme at a time. That is the main goal. So what Kilpatrick recommends onset and rhyme, that's occurring at a younger age level with syllables first and then moving into initial sound. And in the, yeah, in the discussions that we've had, his, um, his understanding and, and his experience in phonological awareness is certainly with older students. So I jokingly said to him, we should put my knowledge of preschool phonological awareness and your knowledge of advanced phonological awareness together and we've got a great continuum. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have, do you teach language uh, first, sounds first or both at the same time? So, oh, are these new questions? Let's yes. see. Teach. I'm, I'm pulling. Oh, you're adding to them. Yeah. Letter names or sounds first or both? Both. Here's an A. Guess what? It says A. Ah. You say it. A. Mm -hmm. A. Ah. Apple. Oh, did you hear that? A. Ah. A. Ah. Apple. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. I think the National hey, Reading Panel. Yep, go ahead. You can read. <laughs> yeah. Reading Panel says that you can use both letter or chips for phonological awareness tasks. Mm hmm They did say that letters would be more beneficial for some, but either way, right. And that there are studies that have identified that in a phonological awareness task. And so at that age level, students are um, probably have, probably in my realm, my realm of early childhood, <laughs> they're probably into kinder first, second grade. And it is making that important connection between the letter and the um, sound representation of the word. And in the big picture, that's what decoding is all about. It is connecting the letter spelling with the sound that those letter representations are. So it's phonemic awareness and letters together. That is what phonics is. And you don't have to spend a lot of time teaching phonological awareness. But let me say this, in Sally Shaywitz's work, nearly 90% of the people who struggle learning to read have some underlying weakness in the phonologic system. And so for those students where there's an underlying weakness in the phonologic system, then you need to make sure that that phonologic processing system is developing so that it then can contribute to the letter spelling orthographic system. Does that make sense? And that is where I think understanding the why you would include letters with the phonological awareness task or why you might not include letters in a phonological awareness task. Okay. Okay. Many programs include substitution and deletion, but do not speak of addition. Do you know why this is? I don't know why it is. Um, and there are a lot of tasks that you can do. Probably um, from a manipulation, I don't know, perspective. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just gonna throw that one out. I don't know. Okay. Older students, what if they can't? do the lower hierarchy skills. I'm gonna say students who can't do the lower hierarchy skills are gonna be struggling with the literacy learning process. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. I had a student when I was teaching at the University of Montana, she suffered her to our language and literacy clinic. She completed her, she wrote out the background history piece she was significantly dyslexic and had not had good instruction. 
and she scored a scaled score of two out of 10 as average, two on a phonological uh, awareness, phonological, it was phonological awareness task. And, and her, the way that she was able to read was by creating a visual image of words. She had an excellent vocabulary, but for the word and, she had two people walking together. And that's how she knew how to read the word and. Can you imagine the cognitive um, task, tax that she had to create in order to come up with some visual representation of what words were? So we started out by building her sense of what syllables were. We started on that lowest linguistic level. She knew what, what, she, she knew what words were and she knew what word boundaries, but we took her through that funnel, the hierarchy in a whole lot of simple, basic phon phonological to basic phonological phonemic awareness tasks to manipulation tasks. And then when we got clear understanding of what words and sounds were, then we applied the letters to them and she graduated from college with honors. She was able, her senior year, able to read the textbooks that she had never been able to read before. It took three semesters, university semesters, to get her to that point. It was remarkable. And what was fun for me was that she could process and or she could describe what was going on in her brain. And she literally would drink almost two quarts of water because she was working so hard at trying to build that phonologic system. It was incredible. Hmm. Yeah, okay. So let's see, older students, for older students, I would say it's never too late to try to teach them. Build those foundation skills, it's never too late. So students who are advanced readers, mostly on the spectrum mm -hmm, and told that PA is not needed anymore for these students. Mom, let's see, a couple of things are going through my mind. I found that a lot of my nonverbal students who have autism when they were little had very weak phonological processing system. And so when we built their phonological processing system and the word I always use bulldozer because that is a word that I remember from one of my little friends. <laughs> in his ability to learn how to say it. Um, so yeah, phonological processing is important for oral language, particularly when students are nonverbal, building that. So that isn't always the case. Um, to teach it or not to teach it if they, if they don't need it, I'm gonna think it is one of those ingredients. And if they have figured out a way around it, uh, yeah, that, that one is a puzzle, mostly because children who, once you've met one child on the autism spectrum, you've met one child on the autism spectrum, right? And so making some generalizations like that, I would stay um, a little bit hesitant of. And, and phonological awareness is going to be needed for a lot more things than just decoding simple words and spelling. How about spelling? Can you do spelling without phonological awareness? Hmm, yeah. Okay. So many students have articulation difficulties combined with their behavior. Yeah. Well, if you can't communicate, then you get itchy. So when they sound out words, they're not the same. Okay. So here was another element. And this is um, in my field, research that identifies that when you are, as a speech and language pathologist, working on helping children build their speech articulation competencies, including a phonological awareness component is valuable. And so with those friends, a whisper phone is gonna be something that is really important and actually more than a whisper phone, but you want uh, headphones with two sides to it and then some kind of enhanced listener so that the sound is going a little bit louder into their ears so that they are hearing that sound as clearly or the sounds in those words as clearly as possible. And then being able to imitate and repeat. And they do get frustrated because if you can't understand it, they can't, they can't get their needs met. 
that is hard. Yeah, so I would, for those particular friends, do a phonological processing assessment and see what that looks like. That may be another means that is going to help them. Okay. How do you support a four-year-old with phonological processing disorder and unable to say certain sounds? You gotta keep teaching those sounds. Those are pretty common ones when children aren't getting it. And I bet instead of g, they say do instead of go. And I can predict they're gonna say tar instead of car. And they're gonna say pish instead of fish. Yeah, and vacuum. Okay, and scope and sequences, the short O is listed under graphemes for short O, but again, under A. Ah, uh, okay, so this, you might see that in the vowel valley. The A ah is a dialectic connection, and here's the difference. Mm. Say the short O sound, A, ah, and here's the A, W, A. Ah. Look what happened to my lips, A. Ah. You try it, say pa and say paw. It's a dialect difference and it has been included in the um, vowel valley, but it is, it's a dialect. We don't say aw in, uh, in the West. How many of you say aw? Paw. What's a dog's foot called? Paw. Paw. Mm -hmm. And when it's 95 degrees outside, like it is right now, what do, how does it feel? Huh? Hot, hot, hot. So that's why. Hot, yeah. Okay, so a little bit different because your lips are spread for short O, ah, and your lips are rounded for the AW spelling. Okay, Hagerty with Kinders, but looking for a phonics curriculum. Boy, so what is a curriculum? I will, honestly, I'm gonna ditch that one and I try to stay agnostic as much as possible. There are more and more that are coming out, which I'm really grateful to see, but you wanna make sure that there is good attention to teaching the letters more than a letter of the week, that all of the components, the name, uppercase, lowercase, sound, have some kind of anchor picture uh, and, and it follows a good sequence of decoding skills with phonological, good phonological awareness components. Okay, talk about new vocabulary words again, can become hard to find a gesture to match a word. Yeah, that can. So sometimes you can just ask children, well, what should we do? Here's what it means. How should this work? What can we, what can we make it look like? Because that kinesthetic connection, the motoric connection is one that's really valuable. So we want to hear it, we want to see it, we want to do something with it. It's got to be um, movement and manipulation or that new word I learned, kinem. Okay, how do you explain all, how all of this relates to spelling instruction? Yeah, well, segmenting is a vital skill for spelling. So you identify and isolate what the sounds are in a word that you want to spell. And then you have to have the orthographic understanding of what the, what the uh, letter pattern is going to be in spelling that word. And good spellers have pretty good phonemic awareness. Spelling is one of those hallmarks of dyslexia and, and one of those identifiers that you can see, can kind of read if you have pretty good oral language and background knowledge and you can infer what some of the words might be. But when you wanna to try to spell words and pulling those apart, that was one of the biggest issues and challenges for the college student that I described in that case study that I, that I shared with you. Spelling is really important for, or phonemic awareness is very important for spelling. Does French follow uh, as a second language, follow the same SOR? Um, I'm not sure what your question is referring to. Teaching children who speak in the French language uh, to read following the same kinds of strategies of learning the letter names and the sounds and then putting those rules together following the French syllable uh, and word 
um, boundary patterns, there's a term for that. It's called phonotactics. Um, yeah, I would imagine that their science of reading um, surely could be used in learning to read uh, if you are a French speaker. On the other side of that, there much of the science of reading and looking at the prevalence of dyslexia across languages, their dyslexia occurs in many cultures, French included. And so studies that have been done identifying prevalence of dyslexia, um, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, not Norwegian, Finnish, French, cross languages. Okay. Uh, body coda is another way of blending. Mm -hmm. How effective is, is that versus onset and rhyme? Thank you for, for uh, putting that in because coda is not often used in the context of uh, phonological awareness and um, along with describing what an onset is. And so the coda is the final consonant or consonants. So in the word fish, what would the coda be? Shh. Or in the word first, what is the coda? St. Mm -hmm. So the nucleus is the vowel. The onset are the consonants or consonants at the beginning of preceding the vowel and the coda uh, follows the vowel sound. And so again, when you want to spell a word, you have to hear the s and the t at the end of first, if you want to spell it correctly. When you're trying to write train, you want to write, you, want, you have to hear the t and the r in order to spell train. So hearing all of those sounds is important. And so pulling them apart is another element that is that that we know works when you well not so much today i think the, a lot of the phonics programs have fixed this maybe you would maybe know better than i but there are periods of time in the phonics programs where you teach tr together it's welded mm -hmm. and what the research showed is that teaches children to read pretty slowly or it, does, it, it doesn't teach children to read in as high of competent levels as as needed but if you teach them that oh there's a t and there's a er and you put them together and it says tr that was a better way and 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 a resulted in better learning outcomes for students in those first years of um, phonics hmm. so again it is pulling out those sounds individually to then blend them together synthesize them together okay okay anything I think further well we had some others but it's getting late so i think we need to call it a night call it a night well i surely hope thank you so much for your participation all of these questions all of the comments and i hope that we're a little further along in our journey i certainly have some new things to think about and and process ponder about some of your questions well, yeah. take Lucy, care was, was i wish you well i thank hope you. you have a very um excellent school year it's going to be a challenge and if it was easy it wouldn't be as worth it it's true thank yeah. you so much take care all right good night be well thank you